I'm a neuroscientist, and like many neuroscientists, I'm fascinated by memory. Uh, this is Nobel Prize winner Eric Kandel, who was one of the first people to study how the brain forms memories. Um, and he liked to think about memory as a kind of glue. Uh, saying the memory is the glue that holds our mental life together, and that without the unifying force of memory, our consciousness would be broken into as many fragments as there are seconds in the day. But despite all of this interest in memory and the central importance of memory for our lives, uh, there's still a lot of basic things that we don't really understand about how memory works in our everyday lives. Uh, so for example, if memories uh, are kind of like a glue, how does that glue work? So one possibility is that our memories work kind of like a video camera where every instant of our lives is joined together into a long, continuous film strip. Another possibility is that our brain actually tries to divide up our day into separate chunks that correspond to different events that happen to us during the day. And it basically individually wraps these little packages and that these individual event chunks are what we store into our memories. Over the past few years, I've been uh, very interested in this question and I've started using functional MRI to measure people's brain activity while I have them watch movies and listen to stories. Uh, I'm going to show a quick example here. This is average brain activity in response to the beginning of this story. And some of you might recognize the movie this story is based off of. Um, and I'm focusing here on this particular brain region which we know is important for building up memories. And what I'd like you to watch and see if you think that brain activity in this region is just constantly changing all the time, or if it looks like activity in this region is switching between different patterns as different events happen in the story. Vinny and Mona stumbled bleary-eyed into a dingy-looking diner. The place was deserted save for a few flies lazily circling around the lamps. The hostess, who was loudly chewing a wad of gum, pointed toward the counter. There's seats at the counter if you want breakfast. Thanks, said Vinny, and they took their seats with a yawn. A cook wearing a white apron emerged from the back room and slapped a single menu down in front of them before silently returning through the swinging doors. Mona picked it up and Vinny looked over her shoulder. On the menu were exactly three choices. Breakfast for $1.99, lunch for $2.49, or dinner for $3.49. Mona tilted her head back and forth in sarcastic ambivalence. So, breakfast? You think? replied Vinny, stroking his chin. So I hope what you could see there is that although brain activity is always kind of ebbing and flowing, um, it really looks like it is jumping between stable patterns of activity and that these jumps occur when there's a new event in the story. And so we think this is evidence that what's happening when we're trying to build memories is that we're taking all the information that's streaming in through our senses and trying to build up some stable model inside our heads of the current event that we're in in the world. And that these individual events then become our memories. And so my collaborators and I have been studying a number of brain regions that we think all work together uh, in order to create these events and then transmit them into long-term memory. But we know that this can't be the whole story because when we're creating our memories, we're not just building them from scratch based on what's currently happening in the world. When you heard that two characters are going into a diner, you can immediately activate all of this common sense knowledge that you have about what typically happens in diners and restaurants, about why they're there and what, what they might do next. And so in the language of cognitive psychology, we'd say that you're activating a restaurant script. And so the idea is that you have this script about what happens at restaurants, that you come in, you're seated with a menu, uh, you place your order, and then finally your food arrives. Right? And you have other information too about, uh, for example, what people's goals are when they go to a restaurant. Right? Why might someone go there? Uh, you might have information about things that can go wrong in this script, like if you try to order something and the restaurant is sold out. And so when we're building up uh, these models that become our memories, we're combining what's currently happening in the world with this whole library of schematic information that we have about the way we think the world works. Right? So we might have scripts not just for restaurants, but for what happens at the doctor, what happens at the airport, uh, going grocery shopping. We have a lot of scripts for what happens in different types of social interactions with other people. Um, so I was interested in trying to see uh, how the brain stores these scripts and how it activates them at the right time. And so what I've been doing is showing people stories that all have some kind of shared schematic script. Uh, so for example, in one of these experiments, we showed people uh, a bunch of different movie and, and audio clips that were taken from scenes from restaurants. Um, and so all these stories are very different, the characters are very different, some are funny and some are serious. 
Um, they're talking about very different things. And I was curious to see if there's any parts of the brain that can actually pick up on this shared restaurant script in these very different stories. Um, and again, we find that the answer is a little complicated and there's a lot of different regions involved. Um, but we have a number of reasons to think that this frontal part of the brain, so this is the part of the brain right uh, between the, behind the middle of your forehead here, uh, that we think that this is really critical for bringing these scripts online at the right time. Uh, so just to give you a sense for what life would be like if you didn't have this part of your brain, um, I'm going to show you guys a clip of something that most of you probably don't have a good script for. Um, this is a clip from the finals of a video game competition. Um, I'd just like you to try to watch this and remember what happens so, you could, uh, so that you could tell me what happened. Here comes the Echo Slam. Where's it going to be enough or not yet? The Fissure is out. Necro Control. It's a nice oldie from Moogie. Maybe the regeneration is enough miracle. The Agency model will pop faith. Able to shackle him forever. Holding him. Up they come once more. No Hex. No Instant Son of Babel. Only Flash on top of Moogie. The Shrines are doing enough. But it's all a miracle show. <laughs> so, assuming that you're not familiar with this video game, that was probably a pretty baffling experience and you really couldn't form a coherent memory of what happened. Right, you don't really have a script for what typically happens in this game. You don't have an understanding of who the relevant characters are and what they're trying to do. Um, you don't even really know what part of the screen you're supposed to be looking at to get information. Um, and so if these scripts are so important, how do we actually get them into our brains? And so one possibility is that we're directly taught them as kids. Uh, so there's this book, uh, Maisie Goes on a Plane, which I've read many, many times with my children. Absolutely nothing happens in this book. Uh, it's basically just a straight description of the airport script, right, and the events that happen when you try to get on a plane. Um, so this is possible, but I think by far the more common way we learn scripts is simply through experience. Right, so those commenters, that, those commentators that were really excited at that, uh, doing that video game, they've seen hours and hours and hours of this game. They have a very good understanding of what the strategies are and what people are trying to do. Uh, so what this tells us is that there's actually a loop in this system that not only are we using these scripts to build our memories, but over time we're trying to look for commonalities across different memories to try to extract the script structure uh, to improve our script library and to add new items to it. Uh, another interesting thing to note is that this part of the brain that we think is critical for activating these scripts um, overlaps pretty strongly with the part of the brain that grows the most over the first 10 years of life. Right, and so what this suggests is that it takes us a very, very long time to accumulate these scripts. Um, so here's my older son, his, his first time at a restaurant, or one of his first times, um, right, and we, first time we're at a restaurant, we have no idea what we're supposed to be doing or what to expect. Um, and it takes us many, many times at a restaurant to actually understand what are the sort of common pieces that always happen, what are the things that sometimes happen. Um, and so as we're learning more and more about the world, we're not just getting better at understanding what's happening, we're also getting better at remembering. Right? And so uh, being able to remember things well is actually not something that we're born with. We need to learn how to remember. Now I'm leaving out a lot of details here and there's a lot of things that we don't really understand. So for example, we don't really understand exactly what information is in these scripts and what information specifically gets stored in our memories. Um, and there's an even bigger question here about how do we actually represent this kind of knowledge in the hardware of the brain, right? How can we use connections between neurons to try to represent this information? Um, and so these questions will keep me and many other neuroscientists busy for a long time. So I've been talking a lot about the importance of these scripts and why we need them, but I'd like to just end on a more cautionary note about the dangers of these scripts. Uh, so there's a classic study in cognitive psychology from decades ago where uh, they basically brought people in and asked them to try to read and remember some stories. And here's one of the stories. Uh, I'll just read the very beginning here. That Rocky got, slowly got up from the mat, planning his escape. He hesitated a moment and thought. Things were not going well. What bothered him most was being held, especially since the charge against him had been weak. He considered his present situation. The lock that held him was strong, but he thought he could break it. He knew, however, that his timing would have to be perfect. So most people, when they read this story, they activate a script that this is about someone trying to break out of prison, and when you ask them later, what did you read, they'll say things like Rocky was mad because he had been arrested. But if you give this story to a different group of people that are wrestling fans, they actually activate a different script, and they'll tell you the story was about someone trying to escape a headlock. Right? And the story was specifically constructed so that either of these interpretations could make sense. Right, and so um, right, these two people had the same exact experience and walked away with totally different memories of what they had just read. And so this tells us a few things. First of all, it tells us that our memories are not quite as infallible as we often think. 
right, that our memories are built not only from what's happening in the world, but also from um, our personal scripts and our beliefs about the way that the world works. And it also tells us that these scripts can reinforce themselves over time. Right? Remember, there's this loop where we use our scripts to build our memories and our memories to enforce our scripts. And so when the world is vague or uncertain, two different people can come with their own personal scripts and both walk away convinced that their beliefs about the world have been confirmed. Right? And they'll be even more likely to apply those scripts next time. So this is a hard problem to get around. Like I said, we need this kind of scripts. We need to use our prior knowledge about the world to understand what's going on. Um, but thinking about our memory system in this way, I think, does give us a few ideas. Um, so first of all, it tells us to be open-minded about our own memories, right? to realize that our memories do reflect what really happened, but are also heavily colored by our own intuitions about the way that we expect the world should work. And finally, it tells us that we should critically reflect on the scripts that we have and challenge others to reflect about the scripts that they're using. And this is especially important for young people that the scripts that you choose to activate now are going to change the way that you remember the rest of your life. Thank you.